everybody. Welcome to Muscle Maven Radio. I'm your host, Ashley Van Houten. Thank you so much for being here. This episode is a doozy, guys. A lot of information. Your brain might hurt. You're going to learn some new things. You're going to be like, what? A couple times, probably. Um, I know I was, <laughs> but that's what learning is all about. It's kind of being uh, taken aback sometimes and being like, whoa, this is completely challenging everything I thought I knew. And that's sort of the hope uh, that I have with this podcast. So this one's a good one. Before I get into it, really quickly, shamelessly plug something, because if I can't do it on my own podcast, where can I do it? I did uh, just spend a month or so revamping my website, ashleyvanhouten.com, obviously. I'll put that in the show notes. Um, Basically, just made the website better for you guys. So there's all the usual suspects of a website. You've got my blog there with some recipes and some articles and some fitness and wellness ramblings. Um, But more importantly, it has more information about my coaching, my consulting, every product and online workshop that I've ever put together is there available for you. Autographed copies of my cookbook, all of my favorite products, links directly to them with all of the discounts. There's a better shop situation there now. So if you want to connect with me, work with me, learn about what I'm doing, um, take some of my courses, all of it is there. Um, I think it's a lot more user-friendly and just better in general. So I wanted to tell you guys that. I'd love your feedback. I'd love for you to go check it out, go buy some stuff, whatever. Just go check out the website. Let me know what you think. Please and thank you. Okay, on to the show. So today I have a posture specialist based in Montreal. Her name is Annette Verpilo. She is the founder of Posture Pro. So this is a health company that specializes in restoring the brain-body connection through really, really advanced rehabilitation, injury prevention techniques, all based around posture. So people come to her who have chronic pain, postural issues, injuries, um, and of course... This is a common thread in this podcast. You guys know this already. If you got a sore back, it's not just that you have a sore back. That is simply a symptom of probably a host of other issues. (laughs) But while most of us at least know that, you know, a tight back is probably actually a symptom of something else going on in the body. And that takes it a lot further um, into the real neurological neuroscience side of things and how our brain is sending signals to our body. The body is sending signals back to the brain. And if somewhere along that line, that feedback loop is being, um, I don't know, interrupted, I suppose, by some dysfunction, um, that's going to cause a lot of problems. So um, we talk about not just your feet, which I think is a common one. We talk about how feet um, and, you know, the fact that we're always encasing them in these squishy shoes, uh, we're not maybe walking or sitting or running properly, all of these things, how all of this stuff starts with our earliest development um, in infancy, in childhood, But also we talk about things like your eyesight, your visual patterns, how that can affect your posture, your jaw structure, your breathing, um, the way that you breathe, your tongue even, like tongue posture apparently is a thing. Um, (laughs) And then some of the issues with how we try to kind of bypass proper um, movement because we're always trying to rush everything, instant gratification culture, you know what I'm talking about, how that can cause problems too. Um, So there's a lot going on and it can be a little bit overwhelming and a little bit sort of frustrating when you learn like, hey, it's not as easy as just walking barefoot or, you know, not sitting so much, which are both things that we should be aiming for. Um, But it's also, I think this podcast is incredibly informative. It gives you some, some tangible stuff you can start doing now to improve some of these things because almost all of us have some dysfunction somewhere in our our body's alignment. Um, But it also, I think, just speaks to how much we can do for ourselves every day, just in little tiny adjustments, tweaks, mindfulness, exercises, investments in ourselves to improve our health and our feeling and our performance and levels of pain and all of these things. So It's really like we go deep on some things. She goes deep even further on her website. She has a TED Talk. She puts out a ton of great information. Um, So this one, this one's a lot. If you have maybe little kids, this one's great. If you have any 
soreness in your body anywhere, this one's good for you. If you don't have any soreness, I would honestly love to hear from you. I don't think that person exists. Um, But there's a ton going on in this one. So uh, without further ado, here is my interview with the awesome Annette from Posture Pro. Welcome to the show, Annette. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So I mean, I've been, like I said, offline, I've been following you for a really long time. I read, you have, you put so much stuff on social media, on Instagram, you have an amazing website with a ton of information. Um, I've watched you on a bunch of other podcasts. It was actually Ben's um, Muscle Intelligence podcast that I learned about you for the first time. And I remember listening to the podcast and being like, okay, there's so much that I potentially am doing wrong, but in a way I also like flipped it immediately to there's so much I could be doing every day to improve my posture and my health and my performance and all this stuff. So sort of a double-edged sword because I was kind of like, whoa, there's so much I don't know about posture. But then I was like, oh, great. There's actually things that I I can learn and I can do just from like watching this podcast. So I'm excited to pick your brain and ask a bunch more questions. Um, but first, your your clinic is based in Montreal, right? Yes. Yeah. So it must, I mean, how has like work and, and how you've been working with people changed over the past year with all of the fun stuff that we've been dealing with? Well, our clinic, we were, we were, even before COVID, we had started offering online consultations because, uh, simply because of the fact that the, the request for working with a brain-based approach is, is dramatically growing. And thank God the awareness is finally starting. People are starting to be aware that there's uh, different ways to look at uh, or to manage the symptoms that they've been trying to manage for you know years on end. So um, there, there was um, in clinic. Obviously, we've, we're taking the right measurements to uh, to see our clients in a safe environment. But on on the other hand, our our online consultations online really um, really developed in that respect, as as well as our online consultations. It, it actually gave us the opportunity to be able to uh, offer our programs online, which which at the end of the day helps us reach more and more people um, in a safer way. So um, I feel terrible for the ones that have had, you know, a great, a great impact in their, um, in their practice. But as far as we're concerned, we've actually, we've actually been able to help a lot of people. I'm sorry. Just, you got just, a friend over there. I do. Just a moment. Quick sorry for that. for dog stuff. Apologies. That's all right. <laughs> Three pounds. <laughs> They're all the small ones are always the loudest. Oh, that is terrible. Bella. Come on. I'm back. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Um so okay, have you noticed any differences since you know, people have been locked down for about a year now since we've been talking and That has, I think, come with a whole host of potentially new challenges, right? Um, From a mental perspective, from a physical perspective. Um, Have you noticed that you are with your clients, with people coming in with complaints or issues um, that they're changing in any way? Or is it still kind of the same basic thing? Like maybe from like, you know, repetitive movements, we're sitting too much, we're not moving properly. Um, is it kind of more of the same or, or is it different stuff you're seeing these days? Well, you know, I think at the, the, the pain level, people being in pain is something I don't think that will, that will ever change the, the, the amount of pain that people are in is kind of the same. Yeah. Uh, but funny enough, what I'm noticing certainly around my, my area is that, and certainly in the early stages of, of the lockdowns uh, last March, um, I was noticing more and more people that are that are actually work have more time to work out and are outside with, with their with their kids, right? I think I think the two things happen: either be, people became <laughs> started turning to drinking, or uh, started uh, started working out. But as far as the pain level is concerned, I, I think that it's it's always been the same. There's there's so much demand. Um, so many people are suffering out there, and so many people are really trying to find a way to uh, alleviate their pain. And what I hear is always the same thing. They've seen so many specialists. They've tried so many things. And and I always start my online consultation with with these questions: How many people have you seen? How many uh, specialists have you consulted? And 
and how much money really have you spent trying to manage your pain? And those questions still, still remain the same. What I'd say, though, is that working out with a body that's misaligned, although it's great that people have started picking up uh, working out when they previously uh, were busy with with work is is definitely when you start to work out with a body that's misaligned. That's when you start seeing, you know, some of those uh, the working out kind of takes out the problem that's already pre-existing. So, um, yeah, uh, on, on that on that spectrum, I think that, uh, you know, most 90 90 percent of the population is still is still in pain and, and is still suffering so yeah. that that has not changed that's one thing i think i learned when i was listening to you too is that i think a lot of people assume because they fall into a generally healthier category like i work out a lot or i have kind of optimal um body like weight or body composition or whatever like i'm probably sorted out and the, the reality is if you're an athlete you might just have different problems than a sedentary person or you know uh we've all we're all going to come with pain it just might be different it might originate from a different source it might be triggered by something different but um most of us could certainly benefit from seeing someone like you um curious when people have pain um, related to, and I mean, it could be muscular, it could be structural, it could be all a host of things, but if they're coming to you and you ask this question, you know, how many people, how many different types of specialists have you seen? Who have you seen? Who do people usually go to first before they come to you? Like, what is usually the order? Like, do people just go see a massage therapist and then they see a chiropractor? And then like, what is generally the order for people who are dealing with maybe chronic or, or even acute pain um, and they eventually come to you? Yeah, I'll answer that question based in, in, in Montreal. Most uh, people that consult a doctor for pain are either prescribed uh, anti-inflammatory infl infl um, uh, inflammation uh, medication, uh, but also they're uh, given a prescription to go see a, a physiotherapist. So physiotherapist would be my first, um, I think would be the first, uh, the first uh, professional or rehab specialist that they would consult. And following that, os certainly osteopathy and, and chiropractics are going to be the, the next, you know, the next two, the next two in line. Um, you know, from the perspective of, of just dealing, and it's not to say that those, those therapies uh, don't, don't work. If anything, they do, they do have a great effect on, on inflammation, but uh, because they're only working on on, on a local area and they're not really addressing the body as a whole. Um, and, and the problem and the issues that most people experience are multifactorial, meaning that there's different parts of the body that are actually affecting the, the symptoms that you're experiencing. Uh, and because of this, uh, and I believe that this is why most of these rehabs are, are unable to provide a complete treatment or certainly complete results as far as the pain that the patient or the client is is trying to manage mm -hmm. okay um so i almost don't know where to start because there's so many there's so many places to start but you talk a lot at length about the sort of you just alluded to it how you know if you have a pain in your lower back like it's probably not just you've got a tight lower back like there's there's definitely a lot more going on and it could be throughout the body. It could be in the mind. It could be your movement patterns. It could be so like, and it probably is usually a host of these things, right? It's usually not one particular problem. It's usually a bunch kind of working together. Um, but one of the kind of interesting things that I learned just sort of reading, going through some of your content is like sort of these like major players in the body. We'll talk about the brain too, but major players in the body, including like your feet, um, your hips, your, your jaw, your eyes, your eyesight. Like that was a crazy one for me. I don't, I, I kind of want to start, like, I don't know if this makes sense. You tell me if it doesn't, but sort of like from the head down, because I think that most people can understand like, okay, well, I've got some like foot problems and that's causing like my knee pain, or I've got like some tight hips. And so that's causing my back pain or whatever. But most people wouldn't necessarily think like there's something with my eyesight or the way I'm using my eyes that is affecting my posture. Can we kind of start from there and like work our way down? 
Yeah, absolutely. So what, what we've done is, is I, I love to figure things out and I have a rehab background. And one of the things that, that I was taught from in school was when someone comes in for a problem, let's take the example of shoulder pain. Um, my job is to learn the anatomy of the shoulder joint and then to do everything possible manually with my hands to alleviate that joint. What I found to be extremely incomplete and, and, and I actually questioned my teacher at the time was trying to understand why this joint has become problematic to begin with. I'm going to exclude any, any tra traumatic um, examples from, from this equation. So when you start to uh, look at how the nervous system develops from the moment of birth to the moment that we start to walk, which is usually 12 months of life, you, uh, and this is, this is a very well detailed in neuroscience, there's three main sources of information that all humans on earth use in order to do one fundamental thing is stand upright. So those sources of information come from our eyes. When, we're, when we talk about the eyes, one will, will tend to focus on, on vision and refraction disorders. Uh, this does play a role, but what we focus on mostly is the muscles of the eyes. In other words, those muscles that are allowing your eyeballs to move 360 degrees. Those muscles, the cranial nerves that innervate those muscles feed right into your primitive brain. So the first source of information is going to be your, your eyes. The second source will be your vestibular system, which is kind of your sense of, of balance, your brain needs to know whether or not your head is leveled on your shoulders. And uh, probably one of the main sources of sensory information is going to be proprioception. And, you know, that's a fancy word that tends to confuse or scare people. But proprioception is simply something uh, is, is sensation that your brain needs to be able to pick up on sensation. And that sensation is going to come from your skin, from your muscles and from your joints. So those three main sources of information makes it to part of your brain that regulates movement, but also controls muscle tone. So in the rehab industry, we've become really good at assessing movement. Hence, I certainly was taught to assess movement, but we're not necessarily taught to look at involuntary tonic posture. This is what do you actually look like before you start moving? So in other words, the posture that we have today, it really is a reflection of the way that our brain is processing input from our eyes, from our vestibular system and from our muscles and our joint. And at that point, our muscles and our joints, you know, I mean, my arm can't really give that much information to my brain in regards to where I am in the room, but my feet certainly can. And this is why we always start from the bottom up because humans walk with their feet. They don't walk on their butt. They don't walk on their hands. We walk with our feet. Now, if you actually dive a little deeper, and I wish I had my skeleton here to show this to you, but if you if you count how many joints are located between the bottom of your foot and your eyes in the human body, all of the joints of the entire human body are located between those two extremities. So what we see and what we know is that when someone has pain and it really doesn't matter where the pain is located, there is always, always an imbalance with the weight bearing surfaces on their feet. So in other words, if I look at their foot, it's not the, they're not symmetrical. The weight surface, the weight surfaces on the left foot and the right foot will not be the same. And the way that their eyes are tracking is also asymmetrical. So uh, that's not a correlation. That's not, that's not, you know, that's not some, that's not a coincidence because when we actually regulate when we create symmetry with the feet and the eyes, there is a direct correlation with their pain. They will immediately feel alleviated. Their symptoms will dissipate. Up, and then there is a difference. You know, everybody functions. Everybody's brain is different. and nervous system is different. So, so no one, the, the effects are not the same for everyone. But as a rule of thumb, there usually is an improvement and certainly a decrease in symptoms. So we know that the minute that there is an asymmetry with those, I'm going to call them those sensory organs, feet, eyes, inner ear, and I'm going to include the jaw in all of this. When there's an asymmetry there, that's going to create sense faulty input to your brain. Your brain processes this information and projects onto your muscles. The problem with the nervous system is that it's a loop. Because the brain uses information proprioceptively to, to uh, decide or to figure out the best postural strategy, 
it also projects asymmetrical information on your muscle and the muscle re-injects that information to the nervous system. So we need to work with a method that kind of cuts that loop, that interferes the loop so that we can start sending proper feedback to the nervous system. And unfortunately, conventional rehab therapies don't cut it because they don't work with a brain-based approach. They work with a local approach. I almost, I like, I'm forgetting that I have to ask you questions because I'm just like sitting here taking this in like it's a TED talk. Um, Okay, so do do you always start that? It's funny because I said like, let's let's talk about the eyes and work our way down. You're like, it's the feet, it's from the feet up. Like that's how this works. But the brain is this integral part of it. You can't ignore this, the messages that are going to your brain and then the messages that your brain is sending back to your body. Um, So how, when you work with a client, how do you start? Like, is it always about, like, do you do like just a general assessment of like how they're standing, how they're whatever, or do you like start immediately with the brain and how their eyes are moving and how they look? Like, how does it so, so it be different for different clients or is it always, should it always start in one spot and kind of work through? So the first thing I want, the first thing that I want to say and, and that I want to clarify uh, is that the 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 feet affect your eye movements and your eye movements affect your feet. Okay. And this is true for humans. <laughs> so if we're dealing with someone that has a brain, a heart, and a nervous system that is human then we're all going to function the same way. The example that I like to give is if I take a cigarette and I burn you, are you going to respond to that? Right? Regardless who it is that we burn, there will be a response because we're dealing with a nervous system. So from that respect, from the moment that we start to walk, which is usually 12 months of life, um, then we start, you know, we start to develop our postural strategies. You've noticed that children and toddlers, when they start walking before the age of six, year, uh, six years old, um, they look unstable, right? Do you know what I mean? They're not really it's adorable. Stable. Yeah, so they're, they're very cute, but they're, what they're actually doing during that period up to eight years of life is they're developing their postural strategies and they're activating muscular chains from the anterior to the posterior to the medial uh, to the lateral and into a cross pattern. And they're actually finding a way to stabilize their head on their shoulder and their pelvis so that, so that they can have the most mobility. So uh, when someone comes into my office, the first thing I'm going to look at 100% is their posture. What does their head look like on their shoulders and on their pelvis? Is the head leveled? Are the shoulders leveled? Is the hip, are the hips leveled? And very often, and these really are the three buffer zones that will show discrepancy, that will show imbalances when someone has been overcompensating for more than a year. So because we walk with our feet and when we actually take the foot as an organ and we look at all of those different joints and all of those different bones, and I have, I have a machine in my office that allows me to measure the actual weight bearing surfaces of your entire body and the way that you're distributing this body weight evenly or unevenly, I should say, on your feet. Uh, it gives me a pretty good indication as to which side you're really compensating more this gives me more clinical numbers, but I can, but we can also assess it through a step-by-step method that shows us uh, in which we've made links with the symptoms and the imbalances that our clients are experiencing. So it does start with the feet for us, but it also ends with the eyes. We take a quick look at the way that the jaw has developed and the jaw, that's a whole, uh, that's a whole other topic, but but just to know that the jaw can influence our stability. One thing to note is that if the feet are imbalanced and if the eyes are imbalanced, this actually creates stress in our nervous system. We might not be aware of it, but not only does it deplete us of energy, not only does it create energy leaks, but it really depletes our cells of energy throughout that day. And if you multiply that, you know, with 365 days and then, you know, uh, one year, two years, 10 years and so on and so forth. So, some people are really exhausted, exhausted from a partial compensation, but also it creates instability. And the moment that you feel unstable and you feel insecure, then you feel stressed. 
So it does have a role also with the way that we manage our stress and with our cortisol, cortisol that is being released uh, in our body. And it makes it, it could make it definitely a little bit more challenging for those of us that are trying to regulate our stress. And certainly stress is a big factor, uh, certainly with, with COVID and people, you know, trying, everybody's more stressed with COVID. But so if you already have a predisposing condition and you have a new stressor that comes into play, then it's just going to make it that much harder for you to be able to manage, to manage your stress. So looking at the feet is step one, looking at the eyes and eliminating those imbalances that we see from the side, that we see from the front, that we see from the top. And we kind of, um, we kind of incorporate that entire assessment with uh, neurological tests as well. And we do include and incorporate uh, the jaw. So, you know, it's very efficient when you work with the nervous system because the speed of the information that's going into your brain is 110 meters per second. So that's extremely fast. So the changes that we see are, are extremely fast. And if we're dealing with someone that has um, a healthy nervous system, you know, like, but like I said, everybody reacts differently, but we usually expect a very positive results results. And I would assume, you know, I've seen on your Instagram that you, you work with young people, like you're working with, you know, eight year olds, 10 year olds, 12 year olds. And as with anything, when we're trying to learn and or avoid bad habits, the earlier you get to it, the better for sure. Um, so would you advise, um, having folks, you know, if they have kids or younger kids, like, do this as almost like a proactive check-in like even if the even if their kids aren't exhibiting any symptoms that they're aware of or any pain or any issues or whatever to kind of come in and have like a a, a session and kind of look at things and like be proactive about it or is it more of a once somebody's sort of having some imbalance issues or some instability issues or some pain issues then you come in like when would for people who have kids who have young kids like would you say like yeah you got a five-year-old like bring them in let's see like how, do, how does that work I love prevention. <laughs> I'm all about prevention. Unfortunately, no one comes and sees me to prevent something that has not yet occurred. Uh, so I'm going to speak directly to parents. The pro true prevention starts with the children. And here's the thing. If you've had complications at birth, if you were stressed while you were pregnant, if your child was born through cesarean, if you uh, needed an epidural, if your pregnancy was very much delayed, uh, if your child uh, had a hard time latching on, on, if they walked too early or if they walked too late, if they, uh, dis if they represent uh, um, hyperactivity, uh, uh, all of those are signs of, of primitive reflexes. You see, before we actually start to walk at 12 months of age, there is a series and a sequence of uh, series and sequence of movements that children must go through in order to activate their brain. What parents don't, uh, most parents uh, are, are unaware of is that the, the, the newer brain, which is, you know, the cortex is, is only gets activated with the primitive brain. And the primitive brain is what is going to pick up all of this information, feet, eyes, proprioception in the first 12 months of life. And the, 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 that sensory information needs to happen in a specific sequence. So let me give you an example. Before a child is able to crawl, cross laterally, right hand, left leg, they're going to go through a series of movements that's going to activate their head, that's going to activate their, their neck muscles, their upper back, crawling hom homolaterally, ipsilaterally, and then contralaterally to eventually stand up. So that sequ those sequences of movements are extremely important and are related to our primitive brain. So uh, there are signs that parents there are things that parents are seeing that I don't believe that they're even aware that there is a problem to, to begin with. But uh, when we're talking about children, the first thing that we do check are primitive reflexes at first. Then we want to start looking at the feet. This is going to be from six years old, uh, six years and up. And then we start, you know, looking at the feet and the eyes. If they're already, um, if they already, if they're still showing signs of retained primitive reflexes, then I would definitely intervene with, with the foot and the reintegration of primitive reflexes. So I think that children 
prevention starts with the children. We've created an online certification that is very affordable that actually goes through 10 essential primitive tests with the testing and the method of correction with summarized notes that are very, very easily digestible for parents. And, and if not, I'm always available for an online consultation to uh, definitely to help or guide you in the right direction. So fascinating. I, I don't think I I even really picked up on the idea that, and you can clarify this for me, but I think a lot of people who have young kids who might start walking, pulling themselves up, moving before they crawl, for example, which can sometimes happen, or, you know, they start walking at like, you know, toddling or trying to walk at like nine, 10 months and it's super early and parents are like, oh yeah, I've got my future Olympian here, like crushing it really early, but that may actually not necessarily be optimal um, in terms of development, if they sort of skip steps? How- well, it's not. It's not optimal. We know this. We know this for a fact from published studies that the, the brain needs a total of 12 months. So usually what the parent, what ends up happening with children that are showing that they want to start to get up beforehand is that the parents, the adults usually encourage that behavior and start, you know, lifting, lifting them up with their hands and starts, you know, <laughs> starts to engage the child. Whereas in actuality, uh, the crawling, that crawling period is absolutely essential to to connect the right brain to the left brain through a substance called the corpus callus. And there needs to be brain connectivity, uh, brain balance, and that brain balance happens specifically with cross lateral crawling. So with, with adults, we see adults that are unable to crawl contralaterally. And very often, um, you know, this can be taken back to the moment that they were that they were babies before 12 months of life. And if you know which questions to ask, and if you ask the right questions as a therapist, very often you'll 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 come you'll come up with a conclusion and they will tell you that you know there are steps, they skipped stages of development when they uh, very early on when they were growing up. Uh, so it's not a coincidence. There's a, there's very clear, there, there's uh, studies out there that talk about primitive reflexes and ADD, ADHD, uh, uh, autism, uh, Tourette's and so on and so forth. And we know for a fact that the integration of primitive reflexes does affect brain development. And if there is a brain imbalance, then there will be a postural imbalance. The postural imbalance goes down to the foot, the foot re-injects it to the eye and the jaw is stuck in between the two. So if you really want to if we really want, if we're really talking in in a perfect world, you would need to address all of those sensory entries at once. So working on one entry is not targeting the other ones. And this is why the results that we're seeing with rehab are are providing only temporary solutions. But the the question that I want to raise for the auditors is how much how much time is it costing you? Because the only the only thing that we cannot buy is time. And if we can make ourselves save time and work with a therapy that allows us to target to kill two five birds with one stone simply by the knowledge of understanding that this these 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 problems that we're seeing are multifactorial we need to work with a method that addresses all of those sensory entries at once that's primitive reflexes that's brain imbalances that's foot posture that's eye tracking And if we're talking about primitive reflexes, we are talking about the development of the jaw and uh, and the jaw and looking at the jaw as well. So with children, it's very, very important to promote uh, nose breathing, tongue posture. And because children do go through a certain development of not having teeth when they're born to having teeth later on, the, the actual jaw goes through stages of development in itself, the same way that we do with posture. And, um, And if we're simply looking at orthodontics and the way that, you know, all of our children are going through our wearing braces now, their wisdom teeth are being pulled out. uh, All of these are symptoms. Mm -hmm. There, There is enough room in the mouth for the teeth to erupt. The problem is with the tongue. So uh, the development of the tongue and breathing, that also is linked to primitive reflexes and it starts with breastfeeding. So in essence, everything is in the first 12 months of life. So what can you do now if it's too late? Well, it's never too late to jump in. It's like working out. Oh, I'm out of shape. Is it too late for me to start working out? I'm 45 years old. No, it's not too late. It's never, there is no age to start working out. There's no age to start correcting your postural imbalances. However, if you don't do anything about it, one thing is certain is that it's not going to get better. It's just going to get worse. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Okay. So much information. All right. Um, 
where do I go with this? Okay. So, and I guess this would also go to like one of the things I've talked about for years on the podcast and the work I do is, you know, I come from like an ancestral health sort of standpoint and like eating like our bodies were meant to eat and move like our bodies are meant to move and all of those things. And and I've had like holistic dentists on the podcast who speak to how our jaws, not even, not even necessarily from a like infant development stage, but just generally speaking, our jaws are changing do a lot because of how we eat and the types of food we eat and how it's developing over time and our nutrition and all that kind of stuff. So like this, this is like a significant problem. And it also goes back to how this is like, this is holistic. Like not only are you approaching this from a brain and body connection standpoint, but it also goes back to just overall health standards for ourselves and how the fact that everything we eat affects all of our health and how we move and how we sleep and how we, you know, just exist in the world is going to, they all have an effect on everything else. It's kind of like, it's mind blowing. I think that the quality of our food is certainly, is certainly a problem, but it just adds on to a pre-existing problem. Right. Uh, Okay. Can we talk about the breastfeeding thing then? And the, like how that's affecting I guess so, our jaw structure. So yeah, so we might, you know, most might not think about this, but when a baby is born, they they know, they know how to swallow, right? The swallowing mechanism and the gagging reflex are reflexes that reside in your primitive brain. Mm-hmm. So if a child, a newborn baby, has a hard time latching on, just grabbing onto the breast and sucking the milk, then that right there at birth already that is the expression of a lack of muscle tone. So that tells you that's a first indication that this newborn baby may have retained primitive reflexes or be challenged with the development or integration, I should say, of those primitive reflexes. So in a normal world, a child should be able to latch on and breastfeed immediately. So that's the first step. Then the second problem is that in Western medicine, mothers are taught and told, uh, and I'm and I'm I'm generalizing. I'm I'm aware that more and more women are becoming aware of this, but we are told to uh, schedule our deliveries. Right. We are told to wrap our baby the minute that the baby is born. Uh, we give birth. Most women give birth lying down on their back through with an epidural that completely desensitizes everything. And um, if we schedule our pregnancy, we're going through cesarean. Well, when the when the baby is born, the first there needs to be in a newborn baby, there needs to be a trigger that tells the brain that the baby is no longer in the womb. And that trigger is movement. So when the baby is is passing through the canal at the moment of birth, uh, there's going to be a movement of head extension. And the head extension is is crucial for activating those genes in in our DNA that tells the nervous system we're no longer in the womb and it's, it's time to start moving through a specific sequence. So in essence, when children are born through cesarean, there is a very important reflex that is not activated at birth. So right off the bat, they're already starting at a minus. So, uh, and then there's going to be the breastfeeding. Most women in the States, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know that in Canada, women can take a total of 12 months off when they give birth. Whereas in the United States, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's three months. That's, I think that's a good number. There are, I know there are plenty of women going the last six, eight weeks. Absolutely. Right. Well, that's right. So that, that, that just accentuates the problem even more. So, so from that perspective, how can women breast breastfeed if they're only given six weeks or eight weeks off of work? It just makes, it just makes it more challenging. So, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm not suggesting that women should stop working, but we, you know, we need to find ways or at least or coping mechanisms or solutions to continue developing uh, or promoting breastfeeding because that is absolutely essential in the development of the jaws. That's going to be your lower jaw and your upper jaw, and it's detrimental in the, uh, in, the, in, in the development of nasal breathing, so proper tongue posture. If a child does not have proper tongue posture, that's the tongue sitting up on the palate, 
all the time, lips close, a proper lip seal, and proper, a proper eruption of their teeth, crowded teeth is, is a symptom of poor breathing. So that has a direct impact. I'm, I'm a posture specialist, so I need to be aware of all of the sensory entries that are challenging the stability that I see in my practice or the posture of, of my clients, while the position of the lower jaw certainly challenges our stability in the sagittal plane or even in the frontal plane. So this is something that needs to be looked at. Now, when a baby is able to breastfeed and swallow, that's a reflex in itself, but there's other reflexes that are that are involved with uh, with uh, the uh, to ensure successful uh, breastfeeding, like the rooting reflex and the rooting reflex, which you can still see in adults that are 30, 40 years old, uh, consists of basically, so basically when you have a newborn baby, when you stroke their when you stroke their cheek, they open their mouth and they go, they bring their turn their head towards the breast to feed. Well, this is a reaction that you still see in adults. How? What? <laughs> yeah, it's very scary when you see it. It's, it's like you're like, right, because you know, yeah, yeah, they're unaware of this. If you simply take an electrical toothbrush, right, and or even a feather and you put it here, you'll see some adults that will literally open their mouth and turn their head on that side. But there's different degrees. Oh, I have tons of videos of this. There's different degrees of, of uh, how active the reflex is, but that is an active reflex in an adult. And that is the primary basic. So for very simple reflexes, they begin at the bottom of the brainstem, which is the medulla. And as you start to develop more sophisticated movements, you go up a layer and up a layer and up a layer, right? Till you reach the entire brain. But then if you're looking at an adult that's 35 years old, that still has a rooting reflex that resides in the medulla, which is the lower part of the brain. And then started, and this adult started to build layers of movement on top of a foundation that is not properly formed, that is not properly mature. You can understand why there are all of these problems I mean, their whole life is in a complete disorder simply because of that one reflex. This is an example, but of that one reflex that did not get properly integrated. So the rooting reflex is also going to be linked with the palmar reflex, which is basically the grasping of the hand, which is essential to hold on while you are breastfeeding, hand-eye coordination, writing, speaking, anything that has to do with breathing. So when we look at it, when we talk about ADHD or anything that, in, that is involved under the scope of learning disability, one has to start looking at those reflexes because if somebody doesn't understand what they're reading because of their eyes or can't speak or have delays in speech, it takes in, you need to orchestrate, there needs to be proper uh, organization of how the tongue and the throat muscles are going to, to synchronize together in order for this child to be able to speak. Mm -hmm. and that becomes more and more, that's very challenging for a child or even a, an adult that has, in this example, an active rooting reflex. That is so crazy. I mean, I guess another like kind of high level takeaway from this is that I feel like human beings, we have this um, desire to cut to the chase, immediate gratification, skip ahead, you know, do things faster. And this is kind of another reminder that like, we are meant to do things in stages. We are meant to crawl before we walk, walk before we run and trying to skip steps before we've fully developed and mastered them is not going to suit us in the long run. So maybe just another reminder for everybody to kind of like slow down and do things properly. Um, okay. Can we talk a little bit more about this tongue posture, jaw stuff, maybe now more from an adult perspective? I know I have plenty of postural problems. Someday you and I, I would love to work with you and you can have a field day with me. Um, but I know that I feel like I always have my tongue sticking to the roof of my mouth. And I think you said that that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like, are there people who are walking around with their tongue at the bottom of their mouth? Is that a thing? Uh, I'd say people are walking. It is a thing, but mostly they're walking around with their teeth clenching. Okay. 
So when I ask someone if they clench their teeth, the first, the, the answer I'm always given is yes, I do when I sleep. Clenching your teeth when you sleep is physiological. It's normal during paradoxal sleep. What's abnormal is if you're clenching your teeth throughout the day. Now, when we think of clenching, we have this vision in our head of somebody that, you know, that's like forcing their jaw like this. No, uh, chewing gum all day long is a form of clenching. So the moment that the teeth are in contact, and it could be very gentle contact, that is considered clenching. Mm. If you're clenching your teeth, your tongue is not properly aligned, or I should say is not positioned on the top of your palate. Now, another thing to look for is it may be at the top of your palate, but is it touching the teeth nice. on the side? Right. So it shouldn't touch the teeth from the front or from the side. There should be... There should be uh, you know, it should just be resting naturally on top of the palate. The problem with that is that that becomes a challenging position to have if uh, the, if first of all, if the, if the rooting reflex is, for example, is not properly integrated, because when someone has low tongue posture, the tongue tends to rest on the back teeth. So it actually prevents the eruption, or I should say proper eruption of the molars and eventually of the wisdom teeth. So uh, this is referred to in dentistry as a bicuspid drop-off, whereas when you look at the teeth from the front, uh, they seem to be aligned. And then when you look at the back, the back teeth seem to be really lower in comparison to the, to the incisors that are in the front. So that would be an indication that someone's tongue posture is not proper. So the first thing you want to look at in adults is just is their teeth. If the teeth are misaligned, if they needed braces at some point, uh, it, you know, in their life, if they had a different class angle, class two, class three, or whatnot, then that's an indication that they have, they may have poor tongue posture. What I'm suggesting is that through the integration of primitive reflexes, uh, doing different exercises with your children, uh, certainly for children to chew gum is excellent for them because it forces them to start chewing, uh, to start developing those muscles. So it's actually a good thing for children, a bad thing for, for adults. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and promoting the development of, of those jaws. The way that I see it, what we inherit from... Um, from our parents and our ancestors is our upper jaw, which is the maxillary with our cranium. But the lower jaw completely develops based on our tongue posture and our breathing habits. So the maxillary for me represents the past and the mandible, the lower part represents the future. When someone is clenching their teeth, they're never in, they can never be in the present moment because they, they are basically, you know, they just stop in that present moment. They're not able to move forward. So there are, there are a lot of impl implications. We know that the jaw is also uh, the tooth posture is, is what is necessary to chew our food, to decorticate our food so that we may swallow it and start uh, ingesting all of those healthy nutrients. So if we have improper tooth balance as well, that's going to affect the minerals and vitamins that we are ingesting because digestion really does start in the mouth first. Um, and it can affect our breathing. And nitric oxide is the number one thing for our immunity, for our heart rate, for our sympathetic system. So if we're breathing through our mouth, we're not tapping into that natural uh, way of boosting our, our immunity, which is breathing through the nose. But then from a postural perspective, it does create imbalances in the sagittal plane as well. So if we're talking just about this, the sensory organ being the jaw, I refer to these as sensory organs. So the jaw, the jaw in itself can create three different problems, a postural problem, an immunity problem, a digestion problem, and a breathing problem. So all of those, all of those entries with the jaw need to be addressed at once if we're talking about a complete, or I should say a global rehab. Mm -hmm. And then furthermore, looking at those entries, the jaw, and then looking at the foot and looking at the eyes. So I guess some general things before we, someone would come in and, and work with you directly, some sort of universal things that human beings can look at with their jaw is, you know, breathing through your nose, 
as much as you can, right? Like there are very few times, I think, in the course of a day or even in a human life when you need to breathe through your mouth, right? Like that's a sympathetic, it's, stressful reaction. Well, it's if you're, yeah. 12 minutes per day when you're, when you're eating. 12 to 14 minutes per day is when your teeth should be in, in full contact. Or if you're like running from a tiger or something, right? Which doesn't happen that much anymore. But like, you know, if, if you're in like a real fight or flight situation, isn't that, that's when you're like just trying to get the thing. Right. right? Well, I don't, don't see many tigers, tigers out in, in North America, but. Well, that's, uh, what, that's what workouts are these days too. But I think even right. that's something that I've been, I've been learning. I've had a couple like Brian McKenzie and some, some super smart people on the podcast talking about like, unless you're literally talking or eating, like your mouth should be shut. You know, you should, you should be breathing through your nose and even applying that to exercise because you're going to get better at using oxygen than if the, every time your heart rate goes up, even the slightest bit, you open your mouth. Yeah. It's not good. The best athletes in the world breathe through their nose. So, you know, it's, again, it's, it's not, it's not a coincidence, but um, yeah, there are, there are different ways to promote that. But, you know, from, from my perspective is why not start at the beginning of life? Yeah promote breastfeeding as long as possibly possible. Uh, if you are not able to breastfeed, that's not a problem. There's other tools and strategies. And certainly from a rehab perspective, if you're a therapist or, uh, you know, just a fitness guru, try to look at all of those sensory entries. Now, 85% of the population has a class two occlusion. The, the moment that the occlusion is a class two, there's a breathing problem. And is that just like the alignment of the top and the bottom jaw that you're talking about? A class two occlusion from the front, if you were to look at someone's teeth from the front, the, the upper teeth in a class two cover the lower teeth by more than one third. Oh, that's me for sure. Okay. So this would be a class one. And if it's it, right, so from the moment that the upper teeth cover the lower teeth, what happens to your mandible is that the, the joint moves up and back. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, you'd see this in, in, in you'd see this in a in a panorex in, a, in an X ray. The mat, the condyle moves up and back. Mm -hmm. So if this reality is true, now now we're switching to a partial perspective. The movements of the mandible of the lower jaw are opposite to the movement of the upper back. So if your jaw is moving up and back, your upper body is moving forward. Okay. Okay, so uh, this, again, this is 85% of the population. This is, this is not specific to you. 85% of the population has a class two occlusion. That's, that's in, the, in, in the frontal plane. Now, if we look at the transverse plane, I see a lot of clients that have what, we, what dentists refer to as a crossbite. That's the lower mandible that passes out, that crosses over either to the left or to the right. That's another problem because then that creates imbalances in the transverse plane. And this is why when we're looking at rehab, when someone says to me, I have shoulder pain, right? And they have a crossbite and a diverging eye on the same side as a posture specialist, how could I not look at the two sensory organ, main sensory organs that are affecting my brainstem, which is affecting the balance of my upper trapezius and my entire shoulder blade. So you said that, you know, a lot of like, obviously so many of us have had braces, everybody's getting Invisalign, you're getting like, you know, jaw surgeries and all these things. And they're in many cases sort of- just, All aesthetic. Right, so this isn't fixing the problem at all. At all. Okay, so how, how what do we do then besides, I guess- Stop clenching. Better, so, okay. Stop clenching. Step one, every single person that, that I see that I say you clench your teeth will say to me, I don't clench my teeth. <laughs> There's not one person that says, no, oh, yes, I'm a clencher. doesn't exist. You have to catch yourself clenching awareness. Now, here's the thing. When you realign someone's posture, and this was actually, I worked with a dentist that confirmed this, but there are published studies out there that confirm this as well. This is, this is not my opinion. If I correct your, if I correct your foot, if I correct your eyes, I change the position of your temporal mandibular joint. So in other words, your posture affects the position of your joint positively and in a positive way. So the first step is to fix your posture. If you've been walking with feet that are misaligned for more than 365 days, your muscles and your ligaments are responding to this reality your body will be misaligned, but also the position of your jaw will be misaligned. Mm -hmm. 
So by fixing your feet and your eyes, by addressing both entries at once, you're realigning your posture, yes. But now in this example, you're also having an effect on your joint, which is going to have an effect on your tongue and your breathing. Okay. Then you need to stop clenching. Become aware of clenching and stop clenching. At the end of the day, if you have missing teeth, then there's not much that we can do because the teeth are not going to grow out again if they're if they're missing. But you know, it's to try to take care of your teeth as best as possible. And this is why I say with children, if we're if we're working with children, there's nothing better than to work with children because that's when we can start looking at true prevention. If we were to address all of our children today in the way that uh, I, in the way that I'm that I'm proposing we do in a global way I believe that the effects of this in the next 30 years would be uh, would be unbelievable mm -hmm. there would be there would be a, a less uh, sessions or consultations for pain in general and and I believe that the world would just be a better place I mean if our brain is better activated and better lit up because our spine is better aligned to fight gravity then that lights up our entire brain yeah, and if we're in less pain and we're in less pain related less stress, yeah, much better. More stable, right? Anxiety lives anxiety lives in the vestibular system. If you're unstable, you're anxious. Mm -hmm. If you're anxious, you're clenching your teeth. Okay, before we skip down to feet, because I could definitely keep you here all day, um, you, you talked a little bit about some things that we could all be doing right now. Like everyone listening has just suddenly been become very aware of their tongue. Um, what are some things that you can do, like the eyesight, eye, eye training or eye movement training? Because I know that this would probably vary depending on the person's specific kind of setup and issue, but what are some things we can do in terms of our eyeballs that are gonna help align ourselves better? So, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that everybody listening uh, already has kind of a little routine in the morning. Uh, either you meditate or you work out or you take your vitamins or you juice or you eat your protein or whatnot. Uh, what I'm proposing is to incorporate a, a neuro approach, in, or incorporate it into your health approach as well, a brain-based approach. And that consists of doing something that's going to cost you no more than a minute or a minute and a half of your time. Um, eye exercises, I think, should be included in, in every every morning routine simply so that, you know, if you stretch your body, you need to stretch your eyes as well. And there's very simple exercises that, that can be done. One of my favorite ones is doing circular uh, clockwise motion in front of your face, as I demonstrated in, in my TED talk. Uh, and that, you know, kind of targets all of the, all the 12 muscles together simultaneously in a, in a 360. Uh, for the jaw, you know, there's uh, stretching exercises for the tongue that you can do. Uh, there is vibration. We've created what we call a vagal activator that kind of vibrates uh, your entire jaw and makes it into your brain stem. So your trigeminal nerve and your vagal tone are being vibrated through the vibration. And that helps with relaxation. For clenching, there's things that you can do even with a piece of gum. You know, you can, you can chew a piece of gum, make it into a, a small ball, and then uh, uh, try to flatten that ball on top of your palate with your tongue so that this forces you to work out your, your throat muscles, but also to disconnect. Uh, I also suggest uh, stimulating your feet and your hands uh, with, uh, you know, they sell, they sell these, um, I had some wobble boards or even spike balls that you can use anything that you do. It doesn't have, it doesn't take much time. You, you know, one minute, a minute and a half per day, you kind of find a way to incorporate that in your, into your routine. So you're, you know, you're just feeding that part of your brain, that unconscious part of your brain that has a really profound inf impact on your tonic posture. What people tend to forget is that Movement is secondary to posture. If you're assessing movement, you have to start looking at someone's posture before they move. And all of those things actually affect the tone of your muscles. And if you're having an effect on the on muscle tone, then you're going to have an effect on movement mm -hmm. and stress. I'll make sure I, we add your, your TED Talk link into the show notes too, so people can check that one out. Um, Okay, so just moving right along now down to the bottom and talking about feet, I wanna talk about footwear too. You've talked you know, on um, some of your posts and information about like footwear for young, young children and how that's kind of a bit of a nightmare. Um, and I know people like to put like cute sneakers on like toddlers cause it's cute and stuff, but this probably isn't ideal for development. So 
what what do you suggest for kids? Because realistically, they can't be barefoot all the time necessarily, depending on where they live. But what are some things? Is there like a minimum effective dose of like walking barefoot that's going to be helpful? Or is it like every minute you've got these big squishy shoes on is is bad? It's bad. And, and, yeah. so bad. Yeah, there's shoes out there that are that are made and that have no arch. They're literally, they're made in leather. <laughs> it's just and they're shaped into a shoe. I really couldn't care less what my shoes look like. I mean, I'll wear the ugliest thing if I have to, as long as my feet are, are comfortable. I, I can't bear to have an uncomfortable uh, feet or cold feet, for that matter. Seeing that I live in, in Montreal, yeah. but with children, um, you have to buy shoes that are really flexible. So, in other words, when you're taking the shoe, you need to, to be able to roll it uh, like a sponge. Uh, realistically, our children will end up going to school in the first year of life. We cannot avoid this in school and kindergarten. They must wear shoes. This is mandatory. So I would suge suggest buying shoes that allows for the normal movement uh, uh, of the foot of, of the baby while, you know, if, if before, before the age of 12, the baby's not well, 12 months, the baby's not walking, but from the moment, from the moment they start walking, certainly shoes that promotes uh, natural physiological movement of the foot. Um, you'll see children walking funny when you put shoes on, the, on, on their feet that mobilizes their foot. The foot is what is what has a direct impact on your spine. And we know from published studies that activation of your spinal cord activates your brain. So if you're looking to activate your child's brain as much as possible to give them the most potential you know, just give them as much as you can right at the beginning of their life. You must look, you must promote foot posture as, as much as possible, which will have an impact on their spinal cord, on their sagittal plane, on their stability, and on the development of their brain. Mm -hmm. So we're talking for kids and adults, go barefoot as much as possible. When you have to wear shoes, we're talking like zero drop minimalist. You can roll them up kind of shoes that, that, you know, let the bottom of your feet really feel the ground. Right. Yes. But I would say with adults, it becomes a little bit more tricky because going barefoot does activate the muscles of your foot. It does. There's a super positive for that. But what we tend to forget is going barefoot. Number one creates calluses. Mm -hmm. The callus prevents us to feel the ground. So it's cutting its proprioception. That's not good. Okay. But also uh, it's actually, it's, it's reinforcing pre-existing problems. If an adult goes barefoot, I have a lot of people that tell me I wear minimal, minimal, minimalist shoes. I've gone barefoot and now I'm in pain all over my body. Uh, the reason being is that they were misaligned before going barefoot. Going barefoot is just going to um, reinforce those imbalances. So what can you do? Well, make sure that your posture is aligned before going barefoot or maybe consider going barefoot gradually to give yourself a chance or your nervous system a chance to, uh, to adapt. Okay. I hope um, that makes sense. No, that's, that's good. I mean, and I think most people, I would hope most people would have the common sense not to like go from wearing like you know, astronaut they shoes do. to, to running 10 Ks barefoot. I get what oh, do, again, do people it. don't like to take the time to do things properly. We like to like rush to, you know, the end game. So, um, okay. So then what are some things we can do to, um, strengthen our feet and improve our posture? Like you said, obviously, you know, in very measured doses, try to be more, um, barefoot, you, you mentioned sort of waking your feet up, maybe rolling it on like a lacrosse ball or one of those little like nubby kind of balls, like wake up sort of the, the, so, so that's going to that's going to have an effect on, on the skin, but then there's so many mobility and proprioceptive exercises, anything that you do to strengthen your ankle joint, right is going to have an effect on, on, on the lower limb, which is going to have an effect on, on your spine. But the number one thing that I would say is you need to figure out at first if there's an imbalance with your feet. I love to do the uh, cardboard test or the pool test or the water test. Call it, you know, there's many different ways of, of calling it. It's simply, you know, taking the print of your foot and stepping on cement and looking at that print and figuring out whether or not it's the same. 
That's going to give you a great indication as to whether or not you have a foot imbalance. One thing to note is that if you have an eye tracking imbalance, which is uh, the test that I do in the TED Talk, asking someone to look at the tip of the pen and you kind of see their eyes moving sideways, if there is an eye imbalance and if you've been functioning with an eye imbalance for more than a year, then there is a foot imbalance. So remember that if your eyes are not tracking properly, your foot is going to adapt. And if your foot is mixed, then your eyes are also going to uh, are also going to overcompensate. So at the end of the day, it always goes back to the same thing. You have to address those imbalances, those sensory organs in order to address your imbalances. And then once these imbalances are neutralized, you can go ahead and do and move as freely as you want, at least you'll know that your structure is aligned. I think another way you can do that too, is when you look at like your worn out sneakers, like I do this all the time before I throw a pair of sneakers out and I can see like one side is way more worn in one area than the other. And you're like, "Uh Oh, that doesn't seem great. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Here's here's a, here's another one is when, you know, when men have their suits tailored with one arm, that's longer than the other. Yeah. <laughs> that, could be, that could be quite costly when you realign them. But I know I've literally had some, some, some man tell me that and they were like in shock as their entire wardrobe is, is custom made. And I'm like, well, c'est la vie. <laughs> Crazy. So you mentioned again, and I've just been talking this whole time about how we need to like get away from this like instant gratification kind of uh, approach to life and health. But you did mention sort of at the beginning of this call that like, you can get immediate um, feedback and and response when you're talking about like neurofeedback and like things that are going on with your brain. So if someone's working with you, if someone's like watching the TED talk, doing the exercises, trying some things, whatever, how quickly can we expect to see? Because again, most of us, myself included, I've been dealing with imbalances that I know are there for my entire life, as far as I can tell. Like I, I, you know, maybe I started feeling them more now that I'm in my thirties and I can feel everything more, but like, it's been way more than a year. Like I've been, I've had imbalances for a long time. So if I dedicate myself to this and I start doing my eye exercises and my foot exercises and my jaw and all this stuff, how quickly can we start to see changes? And can we like really have long lasting improved effects just from doing these things a couple minutes a day? Like, is this, is, is there a, a, do you have good news for us? So no, I, I do. What with the eye exercises and the clenching of the jaw, that's something that you will probably need to maintain for, it's going to sound terrible for the rest of your life. Unless, unless you find a way, the foot imbalance, it's going to be harder to address a foot imbalance with exercises because the tissues and the muscles respond in the same fashion that the rest of your body does. So in other words, the first goal is to figure out if there's an imbalance with the foot. We know that if the, there's an imbalance with the eyes, that's nine people out of 10, there will be an imbalance with the foot. So most probably there is an imbalance with your feet. If there is an imbalance with the foot, you have to create a scenario in which your proprioception of your foot is is receiving sensory feedback 24 hours a day, seven days a week for a minimum of six weeks. And that's why we created our postural insoles because we wanted to work with, with science to understand, to create a texture of something that is extremely thin that sends sensory feedback to the nervous system that is not an orthotic, that does not cut proprioception, that improves proprioception. And what uh, we have different models that allow us to target specific parts of the foot to have a specific effect on the spine. And they're developed, uh, they're based on science, on published studies out there uh, with the understanding of how the nervous system functions, how those sensory receptors in your skin, how proprioception in your muscles and your joint, how that information is sent to your nervous system. And we recommend different models depending uh, depending on the problem that you're facing. There's, uh, for example, rounded shoulders. We have an upper back model, lower back pain. We have a lower uh, back uh, stability or, you know, general foot activation. And all of those products are meant to be used um, momentarily for a certain period of time, six weeks to a year to start changing those motor patterns in your brain that have adapted through time in a faulty posture. If you can, if you can, if you can work your way into poor posture, you can certainly work your way out of it. But the problem is, is that if you're walking with feet that are misaligned for the last 20 years and you're doing rehab exercises for one minute a day, every day, 
it's unbalanced, it's not even. There needs to be the equal amount of stimulation for the imbalance that you've lived with. And this is why strengthening and stretching exercises only provide temporary relief because once the exercise is stopped, the memory of the muscle reverts back to what it used to be. So um, those insoles are, we've created different models that are affordable for absolutely anybody and that serve the same purpose to activate your brain. Yeah, I was interested in the insoles thing when I was looking at your website, because again, you do kind of hear like there was there was a time when like orthotics were all the rage, just like we create all kinds of things to like fix, like get braces, it'll fix your problem. Um, and then there was all this information that came out that this was actually making it worse because it's basically just creating like more stilts for your feet. You're not actually building up like the strength and the whatever that you need. Um, is this something that if somebody wanted to work with this, this insole technology that you're talking about you'd probably have to go into you like well they're they're available there we have different sizes and they're available uh, online you don't necessarily have to come to me you can buy them on our online store we wanted to make them and this is one of the things that we developed with covid is we wanted to make them available to the public following our, our online consultation but we had such positive feedback from so many people that we decided to literally come up with with new models that are absolutely affordable for for anyone now the main difference with orthotics and, and you nailed it is when you put something that that is thick and hard, you actually cut proprioception. Yeah. So your brain is no longer sensing where your feet are on the ground. In other words, you're desensitizing your foot. But if you work with something with, with uh, an insert that is no thicker than three millimeters. So in other words, if I'm putting little wedges on, on an insert and the actual insert is no thicker than three millimeters, I'm doing just, just the opposite. I'm activating the nervous system. So depending on, uh, on what the issue is posturally, then you can create a stimulation in your body through your feet. Okay. So you would still recommend though, probably it would be ideal to have like a consultation with you first to determine what the uh, ideal, 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 yes, necessary, ideal, you know, in an optimal scenario. And if this is something that you want to do, absolutely. But you can also have a really positive effect just, just by, by looking at the end. Our description is, is very, you know, we've, we've tried to make it as clear as possible online. And we have a, a team of passionate people that's available to the public to answer any questions uh, that you may have. These insoles are, are developed on based on, on scientific fact, on the way that the nervous system functions, on the way that humans stand upright on our sagittal plane, on our spinal cord, and they're really meant to activate your brain. Now, if you combine that with eye exercises and clenching, going back to your question of how fast can you see those results? Well, the results are immediate. The insoles function immediately, just like burning you. If I burn you, you'll move your arm instantaneously. The minute you put those insoles under your foot, you're going to have a, po a positive postural response because it's going to have an effect on that skin mm. on the mechano the same receptors that tell your brain i'm being burnt but in this case it's going to be the receptors that send stretch that feel stretch and pressure and that travels just as fast mm -hmm. so the partial change happens immediately in a positive way and through time so in other words the longer you wear them the more you start creating that neuroplasticity in your brain to change those motor engrams and then you start changing your muscular chain and muscle tone okay one more kind of quick question this is sort of a little bit off topic but what are your thoughts on uh sort of like furniture and sitting a lot because I, I i there are some people in the sort of natural movement world that are like starting to get rid of most of their chairs and they're like just sit on the floor and then it forces you to get up and move and like sit in different places and not sit the exact same way for hours at a time and you know what are your thoughts on that as a contributing problem to like chronic pain and posture and turning off different muscles and things like that yeah sitting is a problem <laughs> in yeah. essence we don't we don't move enough uh if you're gonna sit for 
an hour, I'd say go walk for 10 minutes, what you know, in, in that hour, every single hour that that goes by, if you have the possibility of working, standing up, do so. And you know, do the just the reverse <laughs> work standing up for 50 minutes, sit down for 10 minutes and, and stay up. I mean, my entire office is, is set up to work standing up, I, I barely almost never sit down, I'm sitting down now for, for the for the interview, but uh, I rarely do. Uh, so no, I don't think that the, the problem in general is that we as a society as a population we're just moving less yeah so anything that we can do to move remember that movement is life anything that we can do to promote moving symmetrically (laughs) in a coordinated fashion is always going to give you a greater bang for your buck Mm -hmm. okay I think that might be a good place to end because it's time for us to get up and go for a walk. Um, I I could ask you a million more questions, but I think that this is probably a good amount of information for people to take in, you know, in the first shot. Um, where do you suggest, obviously you've got your website, you've got your social media, where do you suggest people start if they're like, okay, I, I know I need some help. I want to get in on this. Um, you know, should they read your, or watch your Ted talk first, go to your website? What do you think folks should do? Well, I'd love for, I'd love for, you know, the Ted talk, was a was a great I think that I, I think that the TED talk is a is a great means of starting to get an idea of, of how it is that we work but certainly you can find me on my website posturepro.co and uh, like I said we have an entire team that's passionate about helping people and spreading the awareness out there and if you know somebody that has pain then certainly for them for the TED talk to them so that they can so that they can start you know understanding that it's not really it's not the symptom the symptom is is not the problem the problem is with posture and uh posturepro.co is where well where you'll find all the information hey if somebody knows somebody without pain i want to talk to that person i want to have that person on the podcast somebody who has zero pain let's talk to that yeah that's i think i I can count on my hand how many people i've seen that have no pain i'm like why are you here just as prevention that just doesn't happen and i'm like how have you made it this far in life it's a miracle (laughs) anyway um annette thank you so much for this it's i always feel like my my brain hurts in a good way after i uh yeah after i have spoken with you or heard you talk there's so much information there and it's it's just super super helpful super useful um so thank you so much for your time and um And uh, we'll do it again sometime. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That's it for today, everybody. Thank you for listening. I hope that was helpful to you. Um, It was a lot of information, a lot to take in, a lot to think about. How many of you are suddenly noticing your tongue in your mouth for the first time ever? Kind of weird. I think one of the biggest takeaways is just, again, how everything is connected. If your back hurts, it's not because your back's tight because of one thing. It's because of everything. And it's because of things that happen slowly and consistently over time. um, And that every aspect of our health feeds into every symptom or lack of symptoms that we have, right? So the sort of bad news is that we probably are um, wiring ourselves for our own pain and stress. But the good news is there is so much we can be doing every day to improve these things. Um, so highly recommend you check out her TED Talk um, and also uh, her Instagram, um, Posture Pro. Um, and I'll put all of this stuff in the show notes. So you can check it out. Um, thanks again, Annette, for the time. It was awesome. And thank you again to my show sponsor, Bubs, maker of my favorite collagen, protein, and MCT. Um, I don't know if you guys know, like I talk about collagen a lot because it makes my skin and nails nice. Um, A lot of people ask me if collagen is like a replacement for whey protein or for steak or whatever, if that should just be their protein. And the answer, generally speaking, is no. Um, Usually you want to use collagen along with other protein sources. It's just that collagen protein is the most abundant structural protein in the human body. Um, So it is integral to the health of your joints and ligaments and Uh, gut lining, as well as your skin, hair, and nails. So, um, and it's because of the makeup of the amino acids. So you don't want to stop taking in every other type of protein that you can, um, but collagen is an excellent, excellent addition for most people. 
especially if you aren't eating a ton of maybe red meat, which is a very complete and bioavailable protein. So um, Bubs is the best collagen I've ever tried, and I've tried a lot. Um, they give a full 10% of their earnings to charity, which is incredible. And they also give you 20% off with the code MM20, um, which is a higher discount than most people are, most companies are willing to give. <laughs> so MM as in Muscle Maven, 20. Go to bubsnaturals.com, get yourself some collagen, treat yourself, treat your body. Your body will thank you. And I thank you for listening and being here and being present. And I hope you join me again next week. Thanks, everybody.